Hello guys, um, in this video we're going to kick off Unit 6, uh, which is all about DNA, the genetic material. Um, and these first set of notes, uh, specifically in this video, we're going to look at Topic 1, which is um, going to go over uh, a few famous experiments that help to prove that DNA is the genetic material. Um, and so, by genetic material, I mean that it's the chemical component in cells that has all of the instructions um, uh, for the traits and programming of the cell and organisms. Um, and for a long time, uh, scientists did not know that it was DNA. It wasn't until the 1950s, actually, that um, it became accepted that DNA is, in fact, the genetic material. Uh, up until then, uh, a lot of the scientific community felt strongly that the genetic material was proteins, and they thought it was the proteins inside of cells and organisms that has the instructions for traits um, and all the instructions needed by the cell and the organism, and that's what's passed on from parents to their offspring. Um, coding all of that information was in the proteins, not the DNA. Uh, so let's go over, though, how they figured out, or some famous experiments that helped build evidence that it was, in fact, DNA. That's the genetic material. So just to go back in time real quick a little bit, um, in the early 1900s, um, if you guys remember in the last unit, we talked about this guy named Thomas Hunt Morgan, who figured out that genes are carried on chromosomes, and so that these genes, um, and the, uh, I mean, the, the, the traits that he was looking at and um, the traits that we're seeing expressed in, in organisms and the, the, the alleles that are passed on from parents to their offspring, all of that information he found out is actually carried on the chromosomes. And it's via the chromosomes that that information um, gets packaged into gamete sex cells that then get passed on to, to offspring. Um, now, the problem is chromosomes are actually made up of two main components. They're made of DNA, lots of DNA in your chromosomes, but there's also a lot of protein in your guys' chromosomes. There's a DNA molecules wrapped around a bunch of proteins. And so it kind of narrowed it down to two possible things that could be the genetic material, either the DNA or the proteins. And um, most, or the huge majority, or the consensus was in the scientific community that it was proteins. Um, everyone felt very strongly that it was the proteins in these chromosomes that was the genetic material holding on to all this information. And so um, let's talk about how we slowly in the scientific community started being convinced that it was actually DNA, not proteins. So here's the first experiment I want to talk about. Um, it's, it's, this is an experiment done by Frederick Griffith in 1928. Um, he's going to do an experiment where he discovers something called transformation. Transformation is when a cell or organism is able to acquire genetic material from their surrounding and use that genetic material to now acquire new new traits. Um, so it's a pretty cool thing that um, especially like prokaryotic cells can do where they can acquire this genetic material and now have um, traits and abilities that they didn't used to have. Uh, and again, so he's going to actually discover that this is possible, um, but he's not going to know what causes it. Um, he's not going to know what is what is allow what is the genetic material that is allowing this to happen um, but he does figure out it's a thing and so here's what happened in his experiment in his experiment he was working with um, a type of bacteria cell um, which is the bacteria cell that causes pneumonia so it's a pneumonia causing bacteria cell and there's two strains of this bacteria there's the the s strain and the R strain. The S strain of this bacteria has this smooth capsule that it's surrounded by, and the R strain does not. So the, the S stands for smooth. They have this capsule surrounding these bacteria cells, and the, the R ones, the R stands for rough. They don't have the, the smooth capsule. Now, what makes these two strains different, other than that, that smooth capsule, is that the smooth strain um, will cause um, sickness and illness and disease and pneumonia in in living things, so in, in mice and mammals and people, it's going to cause them to get really sick and die. Um, so that's the bad, that's the pathogenic strain, okay, very virulent, causes disease. Now the R strain actually um, is pretty harmless because um, the mammal's immune system uh, can actually just target and kill these cells very easily, and so it doesn't cause sickness. So this is the non-pathogenic strain. But the S strain is pathogenic. That capsule helps them to evade the um, mammal's immune system, and so uh, then they take over and kill you. Um, so anyway, here's what his experiment's going to do. He's going to take, he's going to set up four different ex experimental groups here. Um, or for different groups in his experiment. And one of the groups, he's going to take these living S cells, the bad ones, and he's going to infect the mice, and um, he finds that the mice die when infected with the living S cells, which is not too shocking because they already knew that that's the pathogenic strain. He's going to then take R cells, 
um, living R cells and, and, and um, infect them, uh, use it to infect the mice, and then the mice um, in that case don't die, they're healthy and fine, which again is not a huge shocker because they already knew this was the non-pathogenic strain. And then in the third group, he's going to take the, the S cells that are pathogenic and cause the mouse to die, but he's going to kill those cells using heat. So he's going to heat up and boil up those cells um, to the point that they're dead and they're no longer alive. And he's going to infect the mice with those, those heat-killed S cells. And in that case, the, the mice live, which again is probably not too shocking. You just killed those cells, so now you're infecting the mice with dead cells. There's not much harm they can probably do. Um, but then the fourth group, what he did is he took a, a mixture, he mixed up the heat-killed S cells with the R cells. So these heat-killed S cells, just to remind you, didn't kill the mice because they were dead cells. And then the R cells were did not kill the mice, but he's gonna mix the two. And when he mixes the two and infects the mice with it, those cells, that mixture, the mice does, the mice do die. They, the, the mouse is dead. Um, and he actually analyzed the blood of the mouse after and found that there was living S cells in the blood of the mice. So those S cells, which were not present before are now alive and well and um, in this mouse, which explains why it's dead. Um, and so his conclusion is that what happened here, so that was weird, okay, that's a weird thing that just happened. These two things that both don't kill the mice when they're together, all of a sudden the mouse is dead. So his conclusion or his explanation of what happened is that the R cells somehow were able to become S cells. So the R cells were able to be, uh, gain this information that allowed them to turn into the S cells um, that then can cause disease and kill the mice. Uh, and so he caused that transformation. He, he believes that there's some sort of um, chemical component from these heat killed S cells that the R cells acquire. These R cells got some kind of chemical piece of these S cells that allow them to transform into S cells. Uh, and so he calls that transformation, which is a word we still use today in biology. Um, and he calls the, the substance that's that they're picking up, he calls it the transforming principle. So he's, he believes that there's some kind of transforming principle that's being given from these heat killed S cells to the living R cells, allowing the, those living R cells to become S cells. So that's what happens in this experiment. Um, again, he has no idea what that transforming principle is or what is that, um, what, what is carrying that information and allowing these R cells to become S cells. And so it was later on that a group of scientists wanted to really know what was the transforming principle from Griffith's experiment. So in 1944, um, over a decade later, uh, a group of three scientists, Avery, McCarty, and um, McLeod, they uh, did an experiment to figure out what, what was the chemical component from those heat-killed S cells that allowed the R cells to to become S cells. And so here's what their experiment did. I'll kind of walk you through this diagram here. They're gonna take these heat killed S cells, like the one that Griffith used. Um, they're gonna first remove all the lipids and the carbohydrates from these heat killed S cells through some fancy extraction procedures that we don't care about right now, or techniques. And then, so they're gonna have these heat killed S cells, their lipids and the carbohydrates are removed. Um, and then they're gonna set up these three different um, groups. And one of the groups, they're gonna take those heat killed S cells and they're gonna add these enzymes called proteinases. Proteinases are a group of enzymes that destroy all the proteins. So any proteins in these heat killed S cells, they're gonna be broken down and destroyed. So these heat killed S cells, all their proteins are gonna be destroyed. There's no proteins in this sample. And then they're gonna mix those heat killed S cells where the proteins have been removed, and they're gonna mix it with the living R cells. And what they find when they, they take these heat killed S cells and they mix them with the R cells after the proteins have been destroyed, um, they find that later on, transformation does happen. These R cells were able to become S cells, just like in Griffith's experiment when they killed the mice. Um, so these R cells were able to transform into S cells. So that's what happened in that group. And then in the second group, they took those heat killed S cells. Um, and again, the lipids and carbohydrates were removed. And then they add um, these enzymes called ribonucleases, which are enzymes that destroy the RNA. So they're going to break down all the RNA from these heat killed S cells. So these heat killed S cells, they have no RNA. All the RNA has been destroyed. They then take those heat killed S cells with no RNA and they mix it with the living R cells. And those living R cells were again able to become S cells. So transformation still happened, like they were able to, to turn into these S cells. And then the third group, again, they take these heat killed S cells, they remove the lipids and the carbohydrates, and then they add these enzymes called deoxyribonucleases, which are enzymes that destroy the DNA in these heat killed S cells. So these heat killed S cells, all their DNA is destroyed, there's no DNA. They then take those heat killed S cells with no DNA and they mix it with these living R cells and then they find later on that transformation does not happen. So these R cells 
stay R cells. None of them turn into S cells. And it wasn't until you had a group here with those heat killed S cells when the DNA was destroyed, that's the only time those R cells were not able to become S cells. But as long as the DNA was intact, whether you're messing with the proteins or you're messing with the RNA, those R cells are able to become S cells. But the moment you take away the DNA, the R cells were not able to become S cells. So their conclusion is that this transforming principle from Griffith's experiment, they, um, they believe it to be DNA. Like it was only when the DNA was gone that was this not possible. Um, and so that's their conclusion from all of this. Um, and so this was actually very contentious in the scientific community. There is a lot of um, slander. A lot of people did not accept the results of this experiment. A lot of people thought that there is a lot of... Um, um, big errors in this experiment, um, and there is some contamination in some of these groups that they set up. Um, I don't know how much of it is founded in truth or whatnot, but this experiment did not convince a lot of people, um, but it did start a huge debate, I guess, um, because it seems pretty convincing that DNA is maybe pretty important. And so then, in the third experiment that I want to talk about, uh, this was in 1952, there was this experiment called the Hershey Chase Experiment, um, and in this experiment, they're going to look at viruses and a specific type of or class of viruses called bacteriophages or phages, however you want to say it. Um, bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria cells. So they infect prokaryotic cells. They don't infect eukaryotic cells. That's what a bacteriophage is. Um, or sometimes we just say phages for short. But anyway, they're going to use these viruses. They're called T2 viruses, which are these uh, bacteriophages, these viruses that infect cells. And they're going to let these viruses infect um, these E. coli bacteria cells, so this type of bacteria cell called E. coli, um, because they're really interested to see how, how do viruses reprogram cells when they get infected, when they infect the cells, how do they reprogram those cells to become virus-making machines? Because what they knew at the time, what happens, just to kind of give you some background information, so first of all, viruses are not alive. They're not technically cells. Viruses are basically just a container of genetic material that have a, a very good ability or, um, that are really great at um, attaching to cells and then certain types of cells and then um, um, inserting their genetic material into those cells. And then when they do that inside the cell, the cell gets basically hijacked and this genetic material from the virus then takes over the cell and reprograms the cell to start making, building viruses and copies of the virus um, to the point where the, the cell actually explodes after making so many viruses. Um, and then those viruses continue on and infect other cells. Um, so that's what viruses are, are typically doing. Like in this case, that's what they do with these E. coli cells. They're going to infect these E. coli cells, and then they reprogram these E. coli cells to start making viruses. And so they really wanted to know, the purpose of this experiment was what what is the, the genetic material, basically? What is the, the, the chemical component from the virus that's being given to the cells to then allow the cells to now start doing this thing that they never did, where they start making copies of this virus. Um, and so they want to know what's what's holding on to all that information. Um, and so the cool thing, or the, the convenient thing about these viruses they were working with, these T2, T2 viruses, is that they're basically made up of just two components. They're basically just protein and DNA are the main components of this virus. So that in this virus, there's just a bunch of protein and a bunch of DNA. And they wanted to know which one was it. Was it the, when viruses infect these E. coli cells, are they giving the E. coli cells their proteins? Are they giving the R? Are they giving the the vir the cells their DNA? They want to know which one was it. What are they infecting the cells with? And so here's what they did, or here's their experiment, or what they set up here. Um, they are going to take these vir. They're going to set up two groups of these viruses. And so I'll explain each one or the first group first. And so in one of the groups of viruses, they're going to take these viruses and they're going to culture them in a medium containing radioactive sulfur. So. Uh, they're basically growing these viruses um, in radioactive sulfur, which is going to cause the um, the viruses to start having radioactive proteins because sulfur um, is an element that's used to, in proteins, um, but it's not used in DNA. So pro proteins contain sulfur, DNA does not contain sulfur. And so when you give these viruses a bunch of radioactive sulfur, their, their proteins are going to become radioactive. They're going to start incorporating that sulfur into their um into their proteins. And so basically in this group, we're gonna have viruses who have radioactive proteins because they're gonna label those proteins with radioactive sulfur, which is then going to allow them to track where does this radioactivity end up? So now they can track, they, they might not be able to visually see the proteins, 
or any of that, but they can track where does this radioactivity end up um, in this experiment. But it's starting with these viruses having this radioactive protein. And so then they let these viruses with their radioactive proteins, they let them infect these E. coli cells. So they unleash these viruses on these E. coli cells. Um, here's the E. coli cell here getting infected by these viruses that have radioactive proteins. They then blend it all up and agitate it um, to kind of get these viruses to release from all of the cells. Um, and then they pour this solution into these test tubes. Um, and then they put these test tubes in a centrifuge which spins the test tube really, really, really fast, and it causes um, the heavy things that are floating around in the solution to be forced to the bottom of the test tube. And that's gonna be the bacteria cells. The bacteria cells are really big and heavy. The viruses are super tiny. And so this basically forces all the bacteria cells to the bottom, to this, this goopy thing at the bottom called the pellet, which is where all the bacteria cells are. And then they're gonna analyze the pellet, or these bacteria cells, and um, see if they're radioactive. And what they found is that they were not radioactive. Um, after all of this. So when these cells were infected with, infected by viruses that had radioactive proteins, those cells did not become radioactive, which suggests that the proteins from those viruses were not being given to the cells, because if, if, the, if the viruses were giving the cells their proteins, well, then those radioactive proteins should now be inside the cells. But that wasn't the case because these cells weren't radioactive. So in their second experiment, or the second group of their experiment, what they did is they took those viruses again, those bacteriophages, um, but this time they cultured them in a medium containing radioactive phosphorus, so um, which is going to cause these viruses to start having radioactive DNA um, because DNA contains phosphorus and proteins do not contain phosphorus. So now these viruses are basically going to start having radioactive DNA because we're giving them radioactive phosphorus and they're going to start incorporating that radioactive phosphorus into their DNA. So now we'll be able to track where does the DNA go from these viruses because the DNA is going to be radioactive and we can see where does that end up. And so again, they do the same thing. They let these viruses, which have radioactive DNA, infect these bacteria cells. Um, and then they agitate it and blend it all up to get all these pieces, these viruses to separate from the cells. They then put this in a test tube and centrifuge it, forcing all of these bacteria cells to the bottom of the test tube. Um, and then they analyze those bacteria cells in the pellet. And what they found is those bacteria cells were this time radioactive. There was radioactivity in the, the bacteria cells, um, which the only logical explanation for how these cells which were not radioactive at the beginning of this experiment, but now they're radioactive at the end of this experiment, the only place that radioactivity could have come is from the viruses who had radioactive DNA. So this experiment um, strongly supported the, the conclusion that viruses, when they infect cells, they're infecting the cells with their DNA because it was only when the DNA was radioactive that the cells then became radioactive. But when the viruses had radioactive proteins, the cells did not become radioactive. Um, so after this experiment, along with other experiments, but this was the really famous one, um, at this point, we're now basically convincing everyone in the scientific community that DNA is the genetic material. That it has, it can take, it's a very important molecule that holds all of the instructions for life on this planet. And so at that point, this was in 1952, at that point, there became a huge worldwide focus in the biology and chemistry worlds. Of, of, of learning everything we could possibly learn about DNA. So now everyone was obsessed with DNA because this molecule that they thought was not important is actually like the most important molecule um, for life on this planet, you know? And so that's basically it for these, these three experiments that helped kind of push us in the direction of, of learning that DNA is the, the genetic material. And so that's, that's it for this video. Uh, hopefully some of that makes a little bit more sense now. I'll see you guys later.